Uh, maybe let me just send a message. Um, but we are now on YouTube, so don't say anything about me that says I'm un unprofessional or rubbish, all right? Let's save that for afterwards, thanks. <laughs> It's really frustrating, but we are live. We're on YouTube. We'll get started in just a moment. All right, everyone has been emailed. Let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, sorry about this, but we are now going to get started. So let's say hello in the chat. All right. All right. So welcome, Stefan. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to join me on this session, uh, talk about Timone, and work on a live demo. So could you please take a few moments just to let people know who you are, what you're up to, and then we'll kick things off. Sure. Hi, folks. I'm uh, Stefan. I'm uh, a long-term Flux maintainer. Uh, if you don't know Flux, it's a sincere project uh, that does uh, GitOps thingies. And um, yeah, roughly nine months ago, I started a new side project uh uh called timony which is like helm but not helm um doesn't do yamls but qlang and yeah uh works quite nicely with kubernetes uses all the new shiny things in the kubernetes api uh that i've been yeah um working with inside the flux project for the last two years so yeah i'm very happy to share uh, with you uh, my project and yeah hopefully people will get excited about it awesome well i do have lots of questions but i know you've got some slides so why don't you share your screen we'll start with that and i'll throw my questions at you as we work our way through that and then for everyone watching us on youtube the demo will follow shortly after the slides so we will be getting hands-on and showing you how Timoni works in practice cool yeah so <clears throat> uh Timoni. um i call it a package manager and we are going to see through the slides what makes Timoni a package manager, but before I'm getting there, um, I want to frame a little bit uh, how I'm thinking about Timoni, and I, I basically put um, people in two categories. Uh, the first category is software makers, like, I don't know, software vendors that are uh, you know, trying to ship their um, um cloud native apps onto clients clusters uh and of course also open source maintainers uh there are so many open source projects out there for i don't know extending kubernetes like uh, crd controllers and so on and also platform engineers so this group of of, of people and organizations will want to you know distribute applications onto um uh, End users, clusters, or environments. So that's one category that Timony tries to, um, you know, improve their workflow. There, how you author um, your app uh, definition and how you distribute that to everybody. And the second uh, group are end users, Kubernetes users, can be developers, operators, uh, people that 
one to use um, you know well-known defined upstream packages for a particular uh, app or controller or you know uh, complex systems and they want to uh, make use of that to deploy it on their own infrastructure so i think this to, mm, thinking of users in this way it's quite common for any package manager out there. Someone creates the package for an application and someone else uses it. Uh, but with Kubernetes, is not always like that. Usually, um, these two groups can be a single group, right? Uh, if you um, are a platform engineer or if you are a developer in your own organization, uh, you may have to create a distribution for your own app. And sometimes you also manage that app, you deploy it on different clusters, right? So um, this group can be one. Uh, okay, so what is Timony? As I said, is a package manager. It's uh, basically a command line tool. Uh, it's written in Go, Golang. Uh, it's a static binary built for macOS Linux Windows and it has no dependencies on anything on your operating system. Um, and it embeds three core technologies. Uh, Qlang, so basically Timony comes built with the Q engine inside. Um, so it heavily relies on, on Qlang for, uh, you know, when you write your app definition, you'll be writing it in queue. When you want to deploy uh, that particular app, you can also uh, write the deployment, how you configure it and so on in queue. But for end users, queue is not a, a hard requirement. You can also write the configuration in a YAML file or a JSON file and so on. Um, so that's one thing that powers Timony, uh, Qlang. Um, the second one, is the um, um, open container initiative standards. And what standard Timony heavily relies on are OCI artifacts. So what are OCI artifacts? There are these things that look like a container image, but inside is not a container image, can be um, you know, a custom uh, configuration. In, in Timony's case, what's in the OCI artifact are Q definitions, right? So Timony has its own OCI uh, artifact type uh, and is con compatible with almost all container registries out there. Um, they got to a point where, you know, OCI artifacts are not, are, are the standard and they are accepted almost everywhere. And third, of course, it's Kubernetes, like Timony deploys everything on Kubernetes. It, we, I didn't get Timony to Lambdas or anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and- Get, uh, you mean get. Yeah, yeah. never know. Um, the idea here is that Timony tried to use is the Kubernetes API uh, using the latest and greatest innovation inside Kubernetes and most specifically Timony relies on Kubernetes server side apply which is a thing that it's generally available in Kubernetes since two years now so you shouldn't have an issue using Timony you're probably running a, a Kubernetes version that uh, understands this type of operations so how this makes Timony different to other um, tools out there is the fact that Timony, every time it tries to deploy an app, it will ask the cluster, um, to, uh, it will ask the cluster for the current state, and it will compare the cluster state with the desired state, what's in the app definition, and it will only apply changes by correcting the state. So you have like, hundreds of deployments, but you only change one of it, unlike Helm and other tools, Timony will only apply that change. So it will be very, very fast if you, you know, do small changes and frequent changes. Um, okay, next. So what makes Timony a package manager are 
these four core concepts around applications. So first, it allows you to define an app. You distribute that definition. You can compose uh, an app from multiple definitions. For example, if you have microservices, the app concept is a bundle of all these microservices. Maybe you have a distributed monolith. It's also a composition of things. Uh, so it has this feature of allowing you to compose things and that's how your app comes into being. And finally, lifecycle management, which is the core thing that any um, package manager should do. Should, should be able to install things, upgrade things, uninstall it, uh, roll back and, and all these things, which uh, we can call lifecycle management. Okay, so let's do a deep dive into those. Um, so app definition, right? What what that means? Um, how do you define an app for Kubernetes? In most cases, normal cases, right? You'll have a, a bunch of YAML files on the disk with all sorts of settings in there, like a Kubernetes deployment, a service, and so on. But that representation, uh, all these YAMLs on a, on a disk are one way of how that app can be deployed on a cluster. You need to change things. You need to allow your end users to you know, I don't know, uh, fiddle with limits or add, enable some feature in your app to a, uh, in a config map or, or things like that, right? So how do you achieve it in our current day? You have to have some kind of templating engine right? Or you can use customize and you ship a bunch of overlays to your end users, which I haven't seen it done that much. Um, so it, it boils down to, to be able to have a good app definition engine, you need a templating engine. And the templating engine that Timoni chose and is built inside is Qlang. And what that brings to Timoni is, and to Timoni's users is having type safe Kubernetes templates. I'm going to explain a little bit what that means uh, later on. So you define your app with type safe Kubernetes templates, then you allow your users to customize it in all possible ways, but you have total control of what the end user can change to your app. You control what you expose, what you allow them to do. And more importantly, you also can configure defaults, good defaults for your app and so on. So have the app, app definition, then of course, how are end users going to use that app definition. Well, the package manager has to have some kind of distribution mechanism. And the distribution mechanisms for Timony are um, container registries. And I think it's kind of natural these days because any app that runs on Kubernetes, in a way, has to is composed out of one or multiple container images. Right? The app runs in a container, that runs in a pod, and so on. So all software vendors out there already have a container registry uh, or they are pushing their apps to the client container registry. So in order to distribute um, app definitions, you can reuse that registry, which is already there. You have figured it out how to scale it, how to run it and so on, right? So you can push to the same container registry where your app images are uh, the Timony packages. And Timony packages have like two properties. Um, Timony modules are semantically versioned, and this is enforced by the system. Timony will not allow you to uh, publish a new app definition without having a valid sember uh, for it. And why sember is important is not because. <laughs> You know, people have figured out Samware. No, it's not that. Is for me, Samware is more about ordering than anything else. Uh, you can determine what's the latest version by just looking at Samware, and it's quite easy. Now, 
using Semver the right way where you, <laughs> oh, I'm making a breaking change. I'm bumping the uh, major version. Well, not many people do it. I mean, Kubernetes doesn't. It's on one point something and any yeah. final release comes with some breaking change. Uh, but still, Semver as a means of, you know, telling your user this is a release candidate or this is a stable version, it's, it's quite important and I went with that. Um, but Timony also wants to ensure immutability and a container registry does not enforce that by default. If you use, like Timony uses the version to set the image tag in the registry and you can override it. You can push now version 1.0.0 and later on say, oh, I'm going to push again 1.0.0, <laughs> right? Um, and this is also a, an issue with, with Helm and container images in, in general. So how Timony tries to solve this, it allows the end user to specify the version, but also the digest. And the digest in a container registry is immutable. And th what Timony will do, will compare the version with the digest that the user expects. And if that doesn't match, it will not deploy that module and it will say to the end user, hey, you wanted this version with this digest, but this is, they are no longer matching. So you can just delete the version from there and work with Timony just with digests. I know this is not human friendly. You can't just look at the digest and understand it, but for machine is really great. And you should be pinning things using digest and, and Timony tries to make that not also for modules, but also for container images. And I'll mention that later on. Yeah, and also modules can be cryptographically signed. That's also very important and you can verify it. Timoni fully integrates uh, right now with cosign, uh, or keyless or with static keys. Um, so how does a bundle look like? How does a module look like? What, what the uh, software vendor, what the uh, open source maintainer has to create inside a repo? So you'll You'll have this kind of structure is a directory. Uh, you can initialize all of this with a simple command, Timony mod in it, will, that creates this kind of structure. And if you look at it, it resembles a little bit with Helm. I try to you know, preserve the templates directory, uh, but that's the only resemblance. Uh, <laughs> uh, and of course, it has a readme where you should definitely put in there all the docu documentation around your module. And the structure here is very specific to Qlang. What, what is a Timony module is in fact a Qlang module with a more opinated structure. Um, Qlang is, if you're not familiar with it, is this uh, language that tries to unify all types of configuration. You can generate configuration, you can uh, validate configuration, you can also generate code. Uh, you can do even scripting with it. Um, so it's very flexible. It allows you to do a bunch of things. Um, but this kind of flexibility also means that, you know, it's quite hard to get started and figure it out and so on. So Timony comes with a very strict uh, ways of how modules are defined, how they are structured. So it brings some kind of, you know, it's uniform. Well, no matter what repo you'll be looking at that has a Timony module, we'll have to have this structure and it will have to have a particular files with uh, different functions. For example, um, you need to have a templates directory and in every templates directory, you have a config.q, which contains um, a Q definition of what type of configuration your app uh, allows. And it also contains the schema and the constraints. And all of that is, is, is put in there. And then you have a team on ignore and, and so on. Um, all these things uh, that are here. But he, the idea is that your module will contain schemas, for example, all the Kubernetes API schemas. So if you, you, know, you want to define a Kubernetes deployment, you'll be using the upstream Kubernetes deployment schema, uh, which is very different from other templating engines. Why is different? Because once you use a schema, 
then you know that template is type safe. You can you can add there a field, let's say replicas, and you make a typo and you don't type uh, the uh, last s. Um, uh, running a Timon event, Timon will tell you, hey, this this field is not in in deployment. You can't set this field, right? So all those problems where you are just templating over a text, which is some kind of YAML, uh, are quite gone, right? Um, you are way safer using schemas because they are strict and all these fields are validated without you having to apply all the time to a Kubernetes cluster and test if, if these things are, are okay or not. And Timoni goes even further uh, than just offering type safe uh, schemas for and, and templates for, for Kubernetes native objects. You can also um, embed in your modules Kubernetes CRDs. And Timony has a command where you give it a, a CRD definition, let's say, I don't know, certificate from cert manager. And it will generate a schema for you. And when you define a certificate, it will have the same validation it will know all the fields, all the possible values of those fields and so on. Uh, so this is like a, a major step in the direction where more and more controllers are there. And uh, now it's quite common to ship your application, not only with Kubernetes standard APIs, but also making um, use of all these extensions, all these custom resource definitions. So yeah, that's that's how a module look like. Uh, when it comes with a, a whole set of commands for you know creating a module from scratch that's in it, uh, verifying the module vet. Uh, you can build it and see the final YAML or the final JSON. Uh, you can uh, import uh, Kubernetes schemas by just setting uh, the Kubernetes version. And these are curated schemas um, that I've published on GitHub. And you can also, as I said, vendor any CRD you have there by just giving them only the, uh, the YAML of that CRD or, or the URL of that CRD. Um, and of course, it comes with commands for you to actually run end-to-end -end tests like is my deployment, okay, my deployment is valid. It has all these things, but what about, will it work on a cluster? Uh, so it has this apply command. You can, uh, th that works with uh, local modules. You don't have to push them to a container registry and you can do all sorts of tests and create, I don't know, end-to-end -end test grid uh, in CI and, and so on. Um, for distributions, there are also dedicated commands like module push, module pull, module ls, which will query the container register, it gives you all the versions, all their digests. Uh, it also comes with some helper functions like registry login and logout in case you don't have a, a Docker CLI or a Crane CLI locally. Um, and it also allows you to sign and verify uh, modules when you do a push and when you do a, a pull. Nice. Any any ideas, David, so far? How do you like it? I mean, it takes all the boxes for me, right? Because let's go back to everything you've covered so far. Um, I've not made it a secret on my YouTube channel, right? I'm not a fan of Helm. And it's not because Helm does any one thing particularly bad. It's because it's YAML and because Go templating, in my opinion, just isn't good enough. Um, it's a horrible syntax, unless you've written a lot of Go code before, which used to be true, right? In the Kubernetes ecosystem, everyone that was in the Kubernetes space had written a plenty of Go code, probably used the templating language, they were fine. But as more people came, I spent a lot of my time helping people understand Go templates rather than just saying, hey, use this other tool, like Jinja or handlebar syntax. Everybody's familiar with this now. And Go templates resemble it a little bit until it doesn't, like the special dot syntax and the way that, you know, trim and white spaces, loads of weird quirks. However, I'm not going to bash about Helm because Helm has also helped us get to where we are today. Of course. But I, I feel that there has to be something better. And the minute I seen Timoni and I saw that it used Q and it was used in OCI, like it's just like 
stars in my eyes. I was like, this is this is what I wanted. This is this is like if I could build something and I had the the will to sit and do it, this is exactly what I want to see and what I want to see. So I was very happy with it. But I came into this knowing the problem space, knowing that I like Q, um, and and knowing that OCI is where we need to be for like you know future facing GitOps delivery pipelines. But let's assume there are people watching that are interested in Timoni. They haven't maybe got that experience with Q. I would love to know from you, you know, you being the person that made all of these decisions, is one, why did you decide that you had to write a new tool? And why did you decide that Q would be the substrate or the, you know, the, the primitive for building that new tool? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I got to Q out of frustration or... <laughs> uh writing helm charts and i wrote a lot of them and i still maintain a lot of them uh hell will not go away anytime soon <laughs> yeah. uh and i i tried over the years um uh, several technologies that you know um try to enter this space and and kind of fail i think json was the closest one and yeah. There were different projects back in the day that are dead right now. I think the only one still alive and kicking is from Grafana, uh, Tanka. Um, I, yeah, I, Jason, I didn't stick with me. I, I, <laughs> I'm frank. I mean, it, it's powerful. It's, it's nice, but I don't know. I, I couldn't deal with. Uh, JSON schemas on top of JSON and other JSONs and so on. Yeah, it was like yeah. Wait, wait. I think what, yeah, you're you're right. Like I think one of the challenges with JSON at JSON, I don't even know how to pronounce it right. Um, but it was familiar enough if you didn't do anything JSON ish and you just stuck to JSON. But the minute you wanted to start using their functions and the other features that made it as powerful as it, it was, it became so alien so quickly that you just really, oh, this this now doesn't feel like something I'm comfortable with anymore. And that was always one of my struggles when trying to work with it for sure. Yeah, I mean, for me it was like, okay, who uses it right now? And I, I've seen that the Prometheus team is a big fan of, of JSON and I looked at the JSON for uh, deploying Prometheus operator and some Grafana dashboards, and I, yeah, I said <laughs> it wasn't for me. I don't know. I I don't want to say it's not for everybody. Lots of people use it and love it, but uh, it didn't stick with me. Then um, I don't know. Years later, uh, two years ago, I was in in at KubeCon Valencia. Someone came to me at the Flux booth and said, "Hey, we migrated all our charts and all our customized overlay to QLang." I said, okay, I knew about QLang. I I went to their website. I don't know, maybe two years, two years and a half ago. Um, it 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 looked very similar to Go, which I love. I do Go. I don't know eight years now. Um, but then when I looked at their docs, it, it felt like, I don't know, uh, the docs were written for language authors, for academic people. And I looked at that, I and I, yeah, I, I didn't continue. Uh, I, I almost forgot about it. Uh, then this person that came to me in Malaysia, we, we talked a lot, I think we talked a lot half an hour or something. Uh, and he really convinced me to go back home and give it another shot. And um, it took a while uh, for me to really like Q. And because that person was so convincing, like he was like so enthusiastic about it. Uh, Every time I said, okay, I'm going to close this and go back to Flux doing my customized uh, controller or whatever, I said, okay, but maybe I should try more. And yeah, after a while, it, it really clicked at some point. Uh, and I yeah, started doing more and more uh, things in Q, understand better the language. Uh, I think for me, the, the advantage was that Q itself, the language and the engine is written in Go. And if I couldn't, Quite figure out why is this happening. I would I could just go in the source code and read it and uh, and read their unit test, which was very very helpful. Like 
uh, even if the documentation wasn't great back then, uh, they had like really good test coverage. I could really understand what's going on. And I'm that type of person that likes to read code to understand the tool. I, I know like, not everybody should even think about that. It's not good for your health, but anyway, uh, <laughs> that's me, yeah. And what I really liked about Q and I, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of it is the immutability part, which I really, really dislike around how Helm, Customize, and all these other templating languages are, are running. Like you can set a value in base, you set replicas one. Then in some other template, you do an if and you say, oh, replicas here are three. And some later on in your logic, at some point, you remove replicas altogether, stuff like that. So, yeah. which is fun because you have so much uh, freedom, you can do whatever. But when you need to debug this stuff, it, 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 it's a nightmare, right? Well, Q is not like that. Once you set a field, that's it. If you try to remove it or set it to another value, it will say, hey, this field is already set. It has this value. So in a way, even if at, at first I, I felt like really mad about it, like why I couldn't just override this field? It does, why, how can this be a template <laughs> engine if I can't override things? Uh, and then I understood why this is good, right? Because it makes you like for, for a, Money module, right? You really need to define all the things in, in your options in the config file, and you can only set defaults to them. You can't set replicas to into a deployment queue file, and then in the config set a default to five, and somewhere else, like if something, set it to seven, and so on. And even if it's annoying at first, it, it forces you to create a good structure and expose only the right things to the end users. And also for them, it's easier to configure an app because there is one way to do it, uh, not one million ways. Uh, um, of, and of course, customized patches, right? You you have a base, you have an overlay, but then you can create another, another overlay on top of that overlay and so on. And it, even if it's flexible, this type of, you know, hacking almost with all, all these objects uh, becomes really, really hard to debug in the end. And, uh, with with Q, you you have these constraints, so you are you need to understand the constraints. You need to uh, be okay with them, and afterwards uh, things will look better. <laughs> End result will be better if you want. Um, so yeah, it's. I'm not saying getting started with Timon is hard, but it can be a challenge coming from. Helm and customize all because you'll try to apply the same principles and in there and it will not work. So yeah, yeah it has a steep, not learning curve, but more about you need to change a little bit how you think about configuration and templating. Awesome. Yeah, that was a great description uh, of Q and some of its challenges, right? You, you said the word academic, which was was spot on. I remember the first time I looked at the Q documentation and I was like, this isn't for me because I don't understand all this terminology. The lexicon is just above my pay grade in some capacity. Like, do I need to know what a disjunction is to understand the unification model of a Q? What? Like, like sorry, I just wanted to describe some Kubernetes resources. Um, and I think they're getting better there. Uh, you know, it was a very academic project, and I think now it's starting to find a bit more traction. And they are trying to sand off these rough edges, make it easier to consume, and just use it as what it's used for without understanding what's going on under the hood. And I do I completely agree with what you said. It forces you to understand where things become options or configuration for your queue value object. And you have to explicitly make these things that people can consume via definitions, private fields, whatever. And you never said this directly, but I think it's important and that kind of underpins everything that you said you liked about queue. Um, 
the schema definition lives right next to the values themselves. And that's where the unification comes in. Like the schema all gets merged together to give you some sort of concrete value. Um, and I, I think that is something that could throw people off at first. But then once you understand that dynamic, it becomes a bit of a superpower too, because you can arbitrarily throw around definitions and expose them to people and then take in input objects and all this under wonderful stuff. So people will see when we get to the hands-on bit for sure. But, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, having schemas, constraints, and values all in one thing is really overwhelming for someone that starts today. And for, for Timony, you need to get into this as a module, as a module author, when you write your, your uh, app package as a Timony module. But for end users, I'm not exposing them to this type of complexity. For end user, when you configure the app to deploy it, you don't write any schemas, you don't deal with defaults, you don't deal with constraints, you just give the money concrete values. Like I want replicas two, uh, horizontal pod auto scalar max five, and so on. And then Timony injects the schemas, runs the constraints, <laughs> and it will say, hey, you are setting replicas two, but uh, max rep uh, replicas five and max replica three. This is not okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm trying to not expose the end user to all this complexity because all this complexity is really needed on the other side when you compose your app definition, not when you use it. When you use it, it should be very, very simple. And um, yeah, we'll we'll see how, how easy it is when you do the quick start. Okay. <laughs> Uh, last two things about package management. So we see that, okay, Timony allows you to define uh, your app with queue templates. You can distribute those to container registries with OCI artifacts, but how would end users, how would Kubernetes users, developers, you know, everybody that, that has to do something with, with in Kubernetes, how are they going to consume it? And there are two major um cracks here one is app composition where you basically never deploy something alone maybe it has a dependency maybe your app needs a redis server for the caching or uh, the app that you are deploying is made out of multiple microservices some are optional some are not right so uh with helm we have these umbrella charts and so on i didn't i didn't want to, to build that into timony at all um, in Timonin, there is a different approach on how you do app compositions and it's not about writing modules. And we'll, we'll see how that works. It's called Timony bundle. But the idea is you can bundle multiple things to have your app as you want it. And another important feature of, of package management and what Timony also does is lifecycle management. You can install it, you can upgrade it, you can roll it back, you can reconfigure it, um, you can run end-to-end -end tests after an upgrade or after an install. Uh, and all of these things have to be like you know, straightforward, easy to use. And um, we'll see how that goes. So how do you compose things? How do you, you as an end user, how you add um configuration how you specify modules and so on this is done through a timony bundle definition which is a q file uh, the same representation can be done with a yaml file or a json um but yeah i definitely prefer q also on this side because timony comes with some nice uh features when you use q for definitions uh so what is a bundle a bundle is a file where you list instances. What is an instance? You can think of an instance as a hem release, for example. It's it's an instantiation of a module on your cluster. So a bundle is made out of one instance, if you deploy a single app with no dependency or nothing, or a bundle can be made out of multiple instances. And here the example is I'm deploying Podinfo, which is a, a toy app that I made a long time ago. And this app needs a cache server, which is optional, but you can also deploy it with a cache server. So instead of having Redis as a 
embedded in the pod info module, uh, you would deploy Redis from its own module, so deploy pod info from its own module, and then you can have shared configuration between them. In this case, I want to pass a password from the runtime because I don't want to hard code here in, in Q files any kind of sensitive information. So I'm defining, and you can define any type of input. Um, here is just a simple string. Password comes from the runtime. Then I'm using this in string interpolation to set up the Redis URL for pod info. And I'm also using it in the Redis configuration where I explicitly set up the password, here is the value of it. And another thing to notice here, um, modules are referenced by an URL, which is like a container image in, in Kubernetes, but has an OCI prefix. So it's clear that it's an, it's an address to a container registry. Uh, and you can reference a particular version if you don't specify the version at all, uh, Timony will use latest. But as I said before, you can also refer to modules by upstream digest. So you ensure that no matter how, uh, when you run uh, this bundle, it will always use that particular version. Even if you know uh, tags are uh, mutable in the registry, you can refer it by a digest. Um, so yeah, this is how you would be using Timony, you will create these bundle files and you'll apply them and yeah, and Timony will do all the deployment for you and so on. So Timony has commands specifically for bundles. They start with Timony bundle something. It's a, you can verify them, you can build them, you can apply them. Um, you can uh, do dry runs and diffs uh, every time you do an upgrade, maybe you are not sure what things will change on the cluster uh, with that upgrade. So if you do a bundle apply with minus minus diff, uh, I want to show you a nice uh, diff of the Kubernetes objects, only the fields that are changing. Um, and you can query the status, of course, you can delete it. Uh, and you can also distribute bundles, which are Q files and other things through a container registry. As a platform admin, um, maybe you want to create bundles for cluster add-ons and those look the same everywhere. Maybe the password or whatever input is different, but if you want to you know, share with other, other well-known configurations, you can also push bundles uh, and any type of, of Q uh, definition uh, to a container registry. And there are, is this Timony artifact command which has pull, push, list, and so on, like modules. But the main difference here is that if modules, for modules, you need to use SEMWord, and they are SEMWord artifacts, it's free for all. You can do whatever you want here because these are snippets uh, that you'll be sharing. Um, so it's up to you if you want to use a mutable tag and so on. In any case, you can also do a pull using a digest and so on. But yeah, uh, the artifacts commands are a way right now to work around the lack of package management in the Q language itself. And want to explain a little bit what this means. Um, Tiwani has, for example, uh, helpers um, there are some Q schemas, for example, for defining container images, for defining Kubernetes metadata with the right labels, with app Kubernetes labels. So it, you know, you want to ensure some kind of good defaults and you want to have helpers so you don't have to type all this Q code on your own. So you build your little Q library. Now, if someone makes a different bundle on their own repo. The only way right now with Q is they need to copy paste all the files or do, I don't know, some magic with Git and symlinks. I don't want that. <laughs> so uh, this is where Timony Artifact push and pull comes into place. Uh, you can share uh, snippets of, of Q code uh, packages and so on. But the Q team is actively working on shipping 
package management inside Q for um, for the language itself. And I'm very happy with it. They went with OCI as well. So at some point, you'll the future will not have to use the Timony artifact push command. You you'll uh, will able to do this with with Q alone and and share. Uh, code between uh, modules like that. But until then, uh, it's this command that uh, yeah, you can definitely use it today. So I'm curious, I, I, know I, I don't want to ask too many questions before we get the terminal open and get hands on and stuff, but you know, the Q modules, the, the, the Q module stuff that the Q team are working on would be to push arbitrary Q to an OCI and then be able to pull that down and build you know, Q values based on all of that stuff together. I mean, would the Timoni artifacts be different from that with different metadata, different configuration, or would it, are you just going to use directly what the Q team build? Like, it feels like they're different, but maybe similar. So Timoni, the Timoni artifacts command can be used to distribute uh, reusable Q packages. Right, okay. And that part, I hope can be totally replaced upstream using Q get, like go get, and that part will be will will work with the Q tool chain itself. But Timoni artifact will still be useful if you want to distribute Timoni bundles and runtimes as well-known configuration everywhere, because then you can pipe, you can do Timoni artifact pull pipe timony bundle apply from standard in right so it's um it's a hacky way of using artifacts now to distribute things that q itself should distribute but i i made these commands for distributing well-known configuration of bundles uh in the same way as you do with modules the idea is you push your container image the code that's running to the container registry, you push the module, which is uh, how that app can be installed. And then you can push a bundle with secure first defaults. This is how it should be run or examples of best known configuration, right? Okay, got it, thank you. Okay, and the last thing that uh, bundle uh, supports are multi-cluster deployments. And this is something that uh, right now is, is supported as I'm presenting it here, but there is a proposal on the Timony uh, repo on how I'm seeing this in the future, how I want to improve it. Um, the idea behind this is that a bundle can express all the different configurations of one app across your whole cluster for it. And you don't have to have different bundle files or something like that. You can write a little program in Q where all the different configurations, all the differences between how an app uh, uh, must be configured across environments can be embedded in a single file. And with customized, for example, this type of customization means you'll need Three overlays, the base one, staging one, production. Oh, if you want to do customization based on cluster name, then you'll ha have other overlays for each cluster that import the production overlay. And it gets to this, you know, very messy um, file distribution, right? You need directories with files inside, other files directories on top of directories, right? And this is what Flux does today with Customize. This is what everybody does with Customize. It works, it's great. It's pure declarative. You have all these directories on top of those. Uh, uh, you have the overlay system, but with Timony, I want to give people a way to write this in a more compact form uh, and have have the expression of your app across environments in a single file. Of course, you can split this bundle into different files and 
Timony will do a QUnify of all these files so you can have these overlays if you want, but if you don't, and if you want to have everything expressed in a single file, you can do it because Q allows you to do it. You can write uh, if conditions, you can, uh, with, with Timony runtime environments, you can take input from outside, from other clusters, from your local environment, and based on that, you can, you can create this little program that knows how to deploy your app everywhere and um, what what i'm trying to do next is based on 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 this is allowing people to have in queue in a different queue file which is called a runtime uh, file where you can list all your clusters along with the cube context for each cluster so you don't have to do t apply bundle minus minus context production because this is how it works today. And the problem with this is if you mess up your context, you'll end up applying <laughs> the uh, dev configuration on the production cluster or something like that, right? There are many tools to, you know, switch context. You can put the context in a cube uh, environment variable and so on. And it's, it's quite easy to mess it up. So I want to add team on your way of you to declare all the clusters that you have and specify there the context so you'll only do apply minus f this file and team on you will know oh these are all the clusters i need to execute them in this particular order dev first if that goes okay go to staging go to production finally right and do this progressive uh deployment of, of the bundle across the uh, cluster fleet and yeah, if anyone is interested in how this will shape out, there is an issue on the on the Timony repo. Okay, Timony versus Helm. Uh, we've touched a little bit around this. Um, there is also a dedicated page on the Timony website, Comparison Helm, where it's quite a big list there of all the differences. Uh, I wanted here to just you know, showcase some of the performance differences and um, how Timony is, let's say, more performant, more efficient than Helm, just because it uses uh, the technology in a different way. For example, Timony does not store all your YAMLs in Kubernetes secrets. What Helm does every time you do a Helm upgrade, um, even if the upgrade modifies just a tiny uh, bit of YAML, uh, what Helm will do, it will get all your YAMLs in your chart and it will store that in a new secret. And you end up with, I don't know, 10, 20, 100 secrets, whatever you can uh, set a limit for those as well. But the idea is you always have uh, the manifest twice, once in ETCD and on and yet again in a secret and if you version it if you do multiple upgrades you'll end up with all these things and if you do a simple load test let's say you do a helm upgrade in a loop 100 times you'll see gigabytes of data going between the cli the helm cli and the cube api and you can see the amount of pressure helm puts on the kubernetes api and yeah, I, I, <clears throat> my approach to this is I don't want to store all these things twice in the cluster because the module definition is already in your repository, in your container repository. And what Timony does when it creates an instance, it, to it stores in the cluster your custom values because those really matter, and the digest and the URL to the module. So if you need to roll back, if you need to apply an earlier version, you can just reference that digest. Of course, the it's not the same as, uh, as Helm does it, because even if you delete a chart, all the... Um, all the uh, YAMLs in that chart are already stored in a cluster, so you can do a restore without having to pull the chart. Um, but if the chart goes away and the container images go away, you delete the container repo, 
then the rollback will still fail because the images are gone, right? So why Helm doesn't even make a copy of all the images, right? That, that's a real rollback. You need to copy everything in a way. So my approach to this is Timony also creates a secret as a storage. It doesn't store their uh, it doesn't store their uh, YAMLs. It only stores the queue values that you the end user created um, and a list of references, which is kind name namespace API version to all the things that it manages. So this is like a tiny bit of data. Uh, so t you can do all things, uh, you can see what what resources it manages, what, what's their status. If you want to, you know, go back, restore the current version, if you do a kubectl edit or something, you have the uh, module digest there so you can reapply it. So that's one main difference between how t Helm works around state persistence. Um, another difference, uh, in regards to performance is, is what, what I mentioned before. Uh, you have like huge uh, app definitions with hundreds of, of hundred thousands of, of manifests in there. And if you do an upgrade, which only changes one deployment, Timon will only apply that change. While Helm on every upgrade, it will apply everything. And you can see how that can be really impactful for the, your Kubernetes API. Okay, if you want to find out more, there are many, many differences. Uh, I try to keep this list up to date and it's, yeah, on comparison uh, on the website. Some resources. Um, how can you contribute to Timony? There are, well, Timony is Apache 2.0 uh, licensed. Uh, it accepts uh, contributions on GitHub with pull requests. Uh, but I think, you know, code contributions are great, but they are not uh, uh, the most valuable thing you can contribute to. I think the, at this point, the most valuable thing is trying it out. Try to write your own modules and give feedback on that. And if you, if you create some modules, share it with others, right? There are like... I'm not going to translate all the 1 million Helm charts out there. <laughs> I'm not going to do that because Timon is just a side project. I work on it on nights and weekends. I don't have time to do all of that, right? And I, I know there are Timon users right now which have uh, fully migrated for, from their Helm charts to Timon modules. Uh, but yeah, there are so many mo uh, things out there uh, that could be uh, distributed as, as modules. And I think that's that's the most important thing. Uh, feedback on that, uh, how hard it is to you know, create a module. I, I'm quite sure there are so many UX improvements around authoring and helping people uh, write Q, generate all this code. Q is quite challenging uh, when you have schemas and all the things that we said. Uh, I'm, I'm also considering having dedicated docs in the Timony website around authoring modules and maybe uh, have a get started with Q as well, like, but specifically for Kubernetes, not all the configuration out there, right? And that I would really appreciate help from, from anyone who can, you know, uh, build a get started with Q and Timony guide or, or something like that. Uh, I think it's, it's quite more important than someone uh, hardcore hardcore code contributions, which are are nice, but um, it's not the only way you can contribute. Okay, that was it. Presentation. It took some time. <laughs> let's get uh, yeah, let's hands let's, on. Yeah, exactly. All right. So thank you so much for for walking through that. Um, we have a couple of questions from YouTube. However. Uh, I think those questions will be best answered by us just getting the terminal open and actually showing it. So to Stefan and to YMO, your questions are great. And I'd rather show you the answers as we play with Timoni. However, I'm going to be really selfish and ask one of my own questions. Because okay. you, know, that's, uh, you talked about um, 
valuable contributions are going to come from people writing Timoni modules and making it easier for other people to onboard to Timoni without having to write everything themselves, right? The first question that popped into my head the minute you said that was, well, first, yes, let's get people doing that. But what's the discovery mechanism? Um, are you currently talking to anyone at like the, the CNCF or Artifact Hub in order to get Timoni listed there? Is it already listed there and I've missed it? Like, how do people find these modules when they do exist? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I have an issue about, so Artifact Hub is definitely a great way of being able to discover things without locking people into uh, a unique registry or uh, my own registry or something. I don't want to, to have Timony as NPM. I don't want to be the person that runs uh, the uh, authorized registry and everybody has to push there and so on. Uh, the whole idea of distributing uh, Timony modules with OCI artifacts is the idea that you will be pushing your modules next to your app image. And I don't I don't want to host your app images, right? Uh, uh, and it also makes it very easy to replicate it. Like, for example, AWS has public ECR, which mirrors a bunch of things from Docker Hub. When Docker Hub goes down, you can switch to that, right? This could, you could apply the same thing to the money modules. You push the money modules to Docker Hub and you can push it to ECR public, to GCR and so on. Uh, I use uh, GitHub container registry because it's so easy for me yeah. to, to publish there from GitHub itself, but it works everywhere. And the discovery part is, is quite challenging when you have all these modules everywhere distributed and so on. And I will definitely need some help for someone which is intimate with, has some knowledge about Artifact Hub. I see that Tecton and other projects have registered their, their OCI type. is no different than that. Uh, Timoni has its own OCI artifact type uh, and layer type. Um, standard annotations, which are all from, from OCI standard annotations. Uh, I didn't come up with anything uh, special there. Um, so yeah, uh, Artifact Hub is, is one way of doing it, and I will really need some help there. Another idea that I had is uh, run a public instance, a different instance of Artifact Hub only with Timony uh, OCI Artifact in there and use it that UI to only search Timony things. Who knows? But yeah, Artifact Hub will be a first good step forward. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to share my screen and let's start kicking the tires. So. All right, you should be able to see my web browser now. This is the Timoni homepage. If you want to check this out and play with it yourself, you go to tonomi.sh. As always, we first need to install the tool. So I'm just going to grab the brew command and jump over to my terminal and get this kicked off. So we're going to do two things today, if I remember correctly, Stefan. We are going to work through the quick start guide. And then after we get through to the end, hopefully get people answers to all of their questions. We're going to try and show more of a uh, production use case by making this work with like, you know, secrets and other things that become important when you stop playing with the tool and start deploying with the tool. Oh, I didn't even realize the brew command was right here in front of me too. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, in the install page, uh, there are many other ways outside Brew. I discovered, for example, that OpenSUSE team has published a Timony module for uh, an RPM uh, uh, package on their uh, repository and so on. So yeah, I've, uh, yes. there is a Nix uh, package, a Yai package. Um, an arcade package, Alex from OpenFast added it to arcade. Um, hopefully, at some point, someone will contribute it to the Windows ecosystem. It works on Windows, but you have to download the binary now. I know Windows has its own uh, package management uh, 
I'm not sure how to do that. Yeah. All right. And just because I see that there, I'll even get my completions running. Uh, Bruce should have done that automatically. Uh, All right. Okay. Cool. All right. So the first thing we need to do is install a Timoni module. So let's just make sure I understand exactly what's going to happen here and just kind of share this with the people that are watching. When we say install a module, what we're suggesting is that there's some somebody out there, you in this case, has written a Timoni module, thrown it to OCI, and we can just consume that without doing anything right off the bat. We could just say Timoni apply, point it to it, and it's going to throw something into our Kubernetes cluster. Is that correct? Yeah. You also okay. need to specify the namespace where that thing is. Um... Where that's oh sorry no where where that's going to deploy to in the cluster right yes yes so does that use the context namespace or does it actually enforce that we specify it at runtime no uh if you <laughs> if you don't specify it it goes to default but if you have changed your default context it will use that so timony timony the cli is built on top of um the kubectl runtime okay uh package is cli runtime i think uh, so it has all the flags from or from uh, kubectl and knows all things that kubectl knows. Default context, uh, default namespace, and so on. Cool. All right. Well, let's just do a deploy to the default namespace. Uh, and just because I'm always curious, right? If I remove dash dash version latest, does it default to latest? Sure. Let's see. Maybe to let her out and say, hey, you really need to specify Adam. I think uh, so. but I don't it? see your um, console. Don't. Oh. I shared my whole window. What happened? Window. Oh, I shared window, not screen. <laughs> There we go. All right. So uh, yeah, I just did the Timoni apply. I removed the namespace. I removed the latest. Uh, my keychain is asking for stuff. And there we go. So it's applying this to my cluster. And I'm assuming we could run kube control, get pods, watch. Uh, and it kind of beat me, but we do have a pod info deployed 10 seconds ago. So, uh, Also, Timony does a watch. And when you apply it, and it waits for all the pods to be healthy. Okay, so if I run this again, I'm assuming it's just going to say there's nothing to do. Yeah. Unchanged, unchanged, unchanged. Yeah. So, um, you also mentioned during your talk, we could run a diff. Just going to say yeah. unchanged. So that's doing a server side apply dry run. Cool. All right. I like it when things just work the way I expect them to work. It's always an absolute bonus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So yeah, that's this uh, Timoni module deployed to our cluster. So now we can use Timoni to inspect our cluster to work out what Timoni has deployed. Um, now. You said during your presentation that this is not storing secrets. So is this using? Oh, no, this isn't cluster. This is actually inspecting the module, right? Okay. Oh, but so it has the secret. It creates a secret, and it doesn't store inside the secret any Kubernetes resources. Ah, okay, okay. I misunderstood that. So if we run get secrets, oh, we do have a Timone pod info deployment secret. Okay. Yeah, and it's a custom secret type. Instance. Okay. Uh, and if I look at this, we just get the instance base64 encoding. Uh, and this is, I, I'm, again, I'm super curious. I always want to know. So I'm just going to decode it. Did I copy too much? Again. Hey, how's it doing that? 
copy. Do it twice because that always fixes it, right? Yeah. Oh no, I think it's actually just decoding it in line, isn't it? There we go. Uh, yeah. So this is a based on instance. Let's see our. All right. Okay. Got it. So. Uh, this is not a custom resource deployed to my cluster because we haven't deployed anything to money specific to my cluster. This is just a CRD like object that Tomoni understands for what it has deployed to the cluster. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I, my first instinct was, uh, hey, I should have a CRD and CR instead of creating a secret, I should create a custom resource. But that would, kind of beat the purpose of creating a CLI, a CLI should just work. So then if you if I'd store this information in a custom resource, then you have to initialize Timony on every cluster. So you register the CRDs and so on. Uh, so I reserve that for a time where there will be a Timony <laughs> controller. Uh, 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 serializing this as a JSON and put it in a secret uh, for now, I think it does the job and it's the UX is better. You just don't apply and delete no initialization, no versioning of CRDs and so on. Um, but you can inspect what's inside the secret with with the inspect command, and uh, it will it will show you different things from what's serialized there. All right, let's take a look at that then. <laughs> I can't copy and paste today whatsoever. Uh, all right, so let's remove the namespace just because I didn't use one to make my life more complicated. Uh, and we see the digest, the name, at the repository, and the version that was deployed. Nice. Yeah, and if you do inspect uh, values, values for info, you haven't set any values, and it gives you the default values. All right. So I have put in the module as defaults. And um here is what what uh, uh characteristic of Timony modules um compared to helm charts and everything it comes with a specification for container images uh so Timony is aware of what images are in the module what tags are there and if you specify digest it will use digest everywhere and um the vet command of a module will actually tell module authors, hey, you should set a digest, it's empty. <laughs> um, and you can also do, for example, Timony status for Dimfo. And this will also list the images. So when you do a status, it's about, okay, what, what things I have deployed, is my deployment available, whatever, whatever. This is very different from Helm, like Helm, for Helm, a status of a release is stored after the upgrade or install is done. Timony does not do that because I think an app is alive on the cluster. It can fail after an upgrade. So what Timony status does is it queries the live cluster and does a hair check for everything at this moment. Even if the upgrade worked like one hour ago, maybe now you are out of capacity and the things that you thought are ready at upgrade time, now they are failing. So status is a live command uh, that goes through every single resource and uses a thing from, from the Kubernetes project, which is called k-status. Uh, we also use it in, in Flux, which knows how to health check um, built-in resources like deployments, pods, and so on, but also custom resources which have a ready status condition. Um, OK, so this tells us that deployment is available and the replicas is one. If I change the replicas on the deployment to two, does it just say deployment is available, replicas two, or does it tell us that there's drift from what we applied? Let's configure now pod info and make it uh, change the configuration for it from the, uh, oh, you want to change it here? Yeah, of course, it will just tell it replicas too, right? Status does not do a 
dry run or all right okay okay that's what i was curious okay yeah got it all right sweet okay so uh there's our status command we've already kind of done that now so then we have the ability to begin to configure our module by providing our own queue value so to do that we have a queue blob like this and then we're just running our apply command again however we can specify dash dash values and point it to a queue file so rate of values on queue then uh, and we can see what's going on here. So this is configuring the resource requests, CPU and memory, and then setting the limits to be the exact same. I'm assuming we could also do replicas three, like so. You have to look in the readme. I don't know if it's replicas. <laughs> is that part, uh, am I jumping ahead of something that's already in this? But, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I mean, even if I break it, it's fine because Timoni will tell me, right? So yeah. <laughs> so I can just say we want to run a diff. Let's do a server side uh, apply with a diff and specify the values to be my values. Dot two. All right. So we got a value changed. The metadata generation obviously changed. The spec replicas changed, just like I was hoping it would. And we get this. Uh, the resources here. I love this visual diff output as well. This is very clear in exactly what is changing. And this is really difficult to get with other tools in this space. So that's very nice. Hey, did you actually save value skew? I did, yeah. Why? What can, what, why were you curious? <laughs> OK. Yeah, I, I didn't see save it. Okay, you can <laughs> apply now. Yeah. <laughs> the worst that could happen. Ah, oh no, I forgot my, my okay, I shouldn't uh, use myself there. Sweet. And now it's waiting for our three pods to become ready. And if you stop this and you do a status, the status you say progressing in rollout gives you more uh, details basically about what's happening. All right, let's do that. So I'll make this a bit more challenging for the cluster. Uh, we'll do the apply. Let it get to this point and then run our status. Sounding enough because it did it already. <laughs> yeah, pod info is very fast. It's tiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Plus, it's a local Kubernetes cluster where the image is already pulled. So, really, we're not giving yeah, it. They need to scale the single node. Yeah. All right. Well, because I always am perpetually curious, uh, let's do something else, right? So, uh, I don't know if it's in the, the documentation here. I don't want us to drift off course too much, right? But if I want to overwrite the image that is used for pod info, how would I do that? Can I do that through the values? Of course. <laughs> All right. So walk me through that. Uh, because I don't know. Do I just do containers? Mm. No. All right. No. But... Let's look at the default values. Uh, OK, we got that from an inspect, values inspect, right? Yeah. Okay, I got you. So we can say image repository. In fact, let's change the image tag to be a value that doesn't exist, right? So image tag v 12.1.2.3. Well, I guess it has to be. And I suspect here, let's do the def first. Let's not suspect anything. It wants to update the image and it's going to downgrade our, our replicas back to two. And now we can do an apply out the diff. And I'm going to, this is going to say that the image can't come, but I want to see this from it is. We've got an in progress pending termination. Can I do a status? Is there like a watch or something on this? 
No, the the apply would uh, would have waited and report that it can't move forward. Um, and this is not uh, one issue. As I said, it's case status which determines. So the progress deadline for Podinfo is sixty seconds. So after one minute, to say I'm not waiting anymore because you know. Uh, <laughs> There isn't much to uh, to wait for. It's it's gone. It can move forward. Um, and it yeah, it, it basically depends on the progress deadline that you set on your deployments, right? Also, Timony Apply has a timeout um, flag. Uh, I think I set the default to five minutes. But if you are you're deploying stateful sets that are taking half hour, you should set time out half hour and just wait for it, right? It's uh Yeah, I guess what I was curious about is is it gonna surface the image pull back off, but um I guess not. Uh not because for now, it's because the replica set, uh the deployment has not yet given up on the replica set. Ah, okay. Right, it's image pulled back off, so it does a uh, 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 back off for I think. Yeah, it also depends on what your deadline is set in a deployment. I think I've set it to sixty seconds or ten se ten minutes for pod info. Um, yeah. It's okay. I'll stop taking this off course with my my silly curiosity. No, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I set it back. I removed it. Uh, I removed my customization. Uh, and we're now running the standard version. So we can run through the rest of the tutorial, see if there's any questions from the audience, and then I can go roll, give you one, and say, okay, oh, you, can, you can do something uh, interesting here. Like, yeah. let, let's see with, with Helm, if you have a Helm values, you can set some random thing that doesn't exist in the chat, and Helm will apply it, right? Let's say, a ran, let's specify a random field in the values that's not in the module at all. All right. Oh. Okay. Uh, let's do this. Ah, values raw code field not allowed. So, what this thing does is basically you, as uh, the owner of the app, the author of the module, when you define what things end users can fiddle with with your app, the, uh, the options, also the users have this, you know, error in front of them. Hey, you are setting something that wasn't configured, is not allowed because that type of configuration is not something that the module knows about. So there is no point in, in going forward. Like, other tools like uh, customize or whatever, if you specify a patch to something that doesn't exist, to just move and do do its thing. Uh, while I think when you distribute applications, you should, you know, ensure correctness of the configuration, not let the user think it has set something and it has actually changed, while in fact that's not even allowed. Then that saves you from typos bad indentation and, and all of that. It, this is the power of Q in a way. It's uh, Timony just surface, uh, surfaces that uh, as errors be applied. Nice. So I noticed that nothing in my directory at this point in time, because we're working with an OCI artifact. Um, like are these, you know, we, we can use the status and uh, the values command, right? Inspect values. And we can see what these values are. It's, it's cached on a disk somewhere, like the queue definitions that people can look at if they want to? Or is that where the bundles come in and where things start to get vendored into package or et cetera? If you want to see the default values, you say? Well, yeah, if I wanted to um, see the actual definition for this, to see what is allowed. Yeah, right? so you can that. do tmoney mod pool. And I'm going to need that uh, string. Yep. Oh, output path. Yes, there. <laughs> it's a. Uh... Oh, yeah, it's okay. Help. 
Did I set the output path? Ah, output. Okay. It should work with minus O. Well, maybe the directory just has to exist. If you put... Um... Ah, there we go. Yeah, the directory just has to exist. Yeah, okay. this... Actually, someone opened a pull request today to fix this. Oh, nice. You can <laughs> create a directory if it doesn't exist. <laughs> right, so... Now you, you can see the source and usually what you should do is look at the readme right now. Yeah, we don't need readmes. Right? <laughs> we don't need readmes. <laughs> there are, and there is a table there like for hand charts with all the possible configurations and, and whatever. Uh, but let's say you don't want to look at the readmes, you have two things uh, where you can see how the values are. So the default values are in values.q in the root of the module. Yep. Um, and here are just images normally. If you want to see the whole schema of the values, you go templates config.q, the first file. And here you see all the things that you can set with some defaults, with types, uh, right? So you have affinity, you have pull secrets, all the things that you would expect from, I don't know, uh, Kubernetes monstrous deployment, right? You need to specify yeah. all things and understand all things about it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think this should actually be the way people should write modules. I think you should expose, you should put in their good defaults and they should just toggle some uh things uh like auto scaling enable and all defaults should be good uh, i don't know 99 cpu or whatever i would i think the fact that we ship app configurations without good defaults and we and people are now accustomed to do a deep dive there and like set half of the fields in in all the kubernetes things is like we put too much pressure on the end user. We should at least have like a default secure first configuration with, with all things in there or production configuration and so on. And only request people what they really need to add as inputs, I don't know, passwords, certificates, all, all these things. Um, but yeah, uh, the pod info Timony module is a, is a replica of the pod info chart. And that's why it doesn't have all defaults, but I wanted to have this exercise like, okay, I have this M chart. It's been used by, I don't know, it has like millions of deployments. Let me just replicate it and see how, how I can do this uh, with, with Timony, but yeah. Um, yeah, so let me clarify my thinking then just to provide a bit more context about why I was asking this. There's, there's two reasons I, I was asking this, right? Because I think it really surfaces why Timony is so powerful and so good, right? Is one, the Q team are working on an, a language server protocol, an, an LSP. So the author and experience can become a lot better when you pull the module locally or vendor it into your bundle. Because then when you're in VS Code, it can auto-complete all the types based on the Q definitions generated from the Timoni, uh, I can't remember the command. I think it was just vendor CRD, right? Which is very nice. Uh, but also, one of the superpowers now that we're invested into the Q uh, ecosystem, program, community, whatever you want to call that there, is that as we start to build out Timoni bundles that consume multiple modules from across anywhere, right, where we're in a position here, we can now use Q and say, well, our org um, pod security policy, maybe you just want to make this a value like this, could be blah, 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 not that important. And then as we consume other modules, we can then just say pod security policy is our org one. But when you need to override it, you can do that. So you don't have, like, one of the huge problems with Helm is trying to apply policy across a wild amount of uh, third-party external charts for deploying Postgres, MariaDB, MongoDB, operators here, controllers here, whatever. Um, it just requires so much YAML duplication and pain. But we actually have 
with Q, the ability to tidy up and make things actually consumable. And I'm sure Timoni has other layers into that, but we've not even covered yet. So um, again, I don't want to take us too far off where we're supposed to be going through because we are running way over where we wanted to be time-wise. So I just want to check that you're okay for us to continue through the, the quick start and finish. Are you okay for time? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Cool. Sorry, I'm, me going off-road is always going to be a challenge. <laughs> so. Yeah. This is really cool. I'm, I'm loving what we're seeing. So let's, let's let's finish the quick start and take a look at the secret stuff and the production application of this, right? And then I've not looked at the questions in ages. I'm sorry, um, live viewers, but I'll check it in just a moment. So we're, let's do our delete. It's all gone. Come back to our, our tutorial. And now we can start to play with bundling instances together. Uh, and I'm going to copy this because we're going to do a bundle apply. So let's close all this. Bundle two. Uh, what this is doing is saying we want to bundle. We're going to call this pod info v1 alpha one, where we're going to deploy a Redis Redis module and the same pod info bundle that we've already deployed. However, this time we are going to enable caching and point it at this. Uh, and we grab this. I didn't call mine the same as yours because terrible person. There we go. So let's handle like one of the practical questions that I'm sure is going to come from the audience and it's even in my head, right? It's like people watch this, they're like, holy shit, this is amazing. I'm convinced. I'm now team Timoni. That's it. Let's go. Are they working with Timoni modules? Are they always working with bundles? Are they always writing their own bundles that consume modules? Like I am Joe Blogs developer. I turn up to work tomorrow. I say, hey team, this is what we do now. Um, do they start writing their own bundle right away and consume third party modules? Or do they just deploy modules? Like how do you see that working? And let me give you a concrete example because that's, that's very abstract, right? I'm Joe Blogs developer. I go into work tomorrow. I want to deploy MongoDB and a web application. What's the first thing I do? Well, there is no T1 module for MongoDB. <laughs> so you need to spend a lot of time writing that from zero. Then you have to write the module for your own app. And you should definitely publish those to a container registry and use bundles and not rely on best scripts that are calling setting values to this file and so on. You should definitely use bundles and do a simple apply of that and have in the bundle everything. Um, I'm guessing the PVC is failing because maybe your cluster does not have it. We knew that was going to, I, I assured you it would be okay. And uh, now I feel bad. Uh, I don't have. Let's look at the pod info namespace and see what's happening there. Hey, I didn't specify a namespace to the bundle. You did in the it? bundle. <laughs> ah, right, gotcha. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we do have one, though. So why is the claim pending? Oh, because you're not using the default storage class. It's, it's sorry, not you, but you know, it's looking for a standard default class rather than the default default class. Yeah. Right? Okay. So we, we can actually change it. Um, oh, I'm going to. Can I pull a bundle? What? Would I, pull, I would pull the module, right? I do a module pull. Pull the Redis module. I want to. I want to see if I can do this. <laughs> Okay. So Timone module pool. I don't know what's by my, my copy and paste just hates me today, right? Uh, output Redis. And we know that this now needs to exist first. So Mictor is not module pool. Mod. Right, so let's go back to VS Code. And I open something else. That's okay. 
Uh, Tempest config. So now I know. Oh, you don't have to scroll much. Yeah. So I can just set persistence storage class. So let's do this up. I can tell you no queue <laughs> because most people wouldn't know to, you know, uh, wrap it inside values. Uh, I have done a lot with Q. Um, I actually have a couple of tools I built on top of Q myself, so I'm very familiar with it. Uh, now, my storage class is called local path. Um, now, I could just leave this as blank, which would pull the default, but we'll do it this way. No, it uh, should be. Oh, that's, that's the name. Okay. Yeah, that's the name. But I mean, we could just force it to blank, which would tell the cluster to use the default storage class. Let's 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 try it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's just fill that, um, and then we'll do our twenty bundle apply. And if we just come down here, oh, well, it's immutable. Yeah, let's do a force apply. I was going to just delete the claim, but I guess this also works. Uh, and then if we do a get PVC, uh, watch. So what what Timony does, it has code that detects immutable errors returned by the Kubernetes API. And when you set it to force, or you can also add annotations for those objects, it will recreate them. But force is it tells him only, hey, look for immutable errors. And if there are any immutable errors, only then recreate the object. Don't destroy objects which don't have immutable uh, changes to immutable fields inside. Um, so yeah, force is quite special. <laughs> yeah. Well, even when I set the storage class, it's still failing. So that's my bad. <laughs> but it's OK. We planned for this. I planned for this. And my, well, that's a lot of downloads. Uh, and my downloads folder, I'll check my name over here to spare everybody the mess of my downloads folder. I have a kubeconfig file, which we'll nicely put here, where I will export kubeconfig equals pwdkc. We will do, oh, that okay. actually worked. It, it worked, it worked. <laughs> And I was going to go to my backup cube cluster. Uh, so get PVC. Okay, so it's just a slow, but we got it. Nice. Awesome. Good. And cool. Sweet. Nice. Yeah. And it also has end-to-end -end tests. So if we look a little bit at what the output of, of the bundle apply is, you'll see that it goes into stages. And the module creators, the software vendors, they can they have control over stages. And they can instruct him on how to apply things in stages to have checks run end-to-end -end tests, then move to another thing. For example, Orchestrating a Redis deployment, in my case, is first you create a master node with a persistent claim. You wait for that to be healthy. Then you create a replica set, the, replic the Redis replicas. And at the end, you run an end-to-end -end test to make sure that the cluster is in good shape and only then move to the app that uses Redis. Ah, that was so subtle. I didn't notice that, but you're right. Look, we have service account, config map, and Redis master, then it has the replicas. And then I, I just didn't even notice the job with the Redis test. Nice. Yeah. So, so what does that look like in Timoni Q? Is that in the, this here? Yeah. Ah, so you can have multiple apply steps like so. Then you have conditions. If the end user wants to run the test, and the test is enabling values, only then do the test jobs. And how Timony treats tests is yet very different from what Helm does. For, for Timony, tests are part 
of the desired state. They are not some afterthought that they can exist. You, there is no test command. You don't run tests out of uh, nothing. And how tests are, are, are part of the desired state. And every time, if you run now again the apply, there will be no test run because the desired state didn't change. But if you change a value, then Timon will regenerate the, the job and it will run the test because you want to run tests only when things change. So that's also a big difference in how it does it. Oh, yeah. It's unchanged, right? Yeah. But if you change something in your Redis configuration, then the computed checksum of the desired state changes, and that uh, tells him when he have to wipe out the old job clear it out uh, also along with all the pods and run a new test. Uh, so yeah, tests are quite different. And here in, in Timon EQ, where the module authors have the whole power of defining how the apply work, you can also set here um, things like, I want to apply this only if an object does not exist on the cluster. And this is how you can do the same stuff as have uh, uh, pre-install hooks. Uh, because Timony has no hooks. It's always an apply. There are no, there is no, uh, uh, there is no install, there is no upgrade. It's apply, right? But you can uh, have with, uh, with, uh, with save Timony, apply this only if it doesn't exist or apply it anytime or clean it up after you applied it, right? So that's how we can do prerequisites for an installation or prerequisites only for upgrades and, and, and so on. All right, uh, quick question then. This, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious how you loop over these stages, right? Because there's no specific ordering other than the order that you put them inside of this file. Um, and maybe this, so does Q maintain that order? Well, yeah, of course. Ah, I actually didn't know that. Nice. Okay, very cool. So I'm using the AST to walk the Q files. Ah, okay. So if the file is one after the other, why wouldn't I execute it in that direction? Ah, okay. So you're not actually just rendering out the concrete value. You're working with the Q value itself as part of Timoni. So Yeah, there are many, many things that Timoni does <laughs> around Q files. It's, it's, some files get directly compiled uh, for other files. I'm working the ST from other files. I'm doing unifying. Yeah, it's uh, it was quite an adventure, but I like it in a way. Yeah, I learned a lot, a lot of Q internals. <laughs> All right. Uh, Let's tackle the question and then we'll do the secret stuff and then we'll finish up for today's session. So yeah. uh, Daniel says, this looks so good. Awesome, we glad you like this, Daniel. Why well, I'm always asking if we can touch on, and I'll say we, but I mean you, Stefan, uh, could you touch on what this looks like for working with two separate teams, like a, a platform team and a dev team uh, working with bundles? As in maybe two separate repos managed by the same app from two separate teams with different concerns. Uh, let's see if I can put that sentence together in a way that I understand. Do you know what why I'm always asking there, Stefan? So from a platform team perspective and dev teams or operations team, right? Yeah. There are several approaches here. Uh, I imagine the platform team will want to design Timoni modules for generic modules for not GSFs that have the right I don't know, Nginx sidecar uh, that exposes metrics, then the uh, not the GS app uh, container limits, all things in there, right? Then the dev team, when he, they want to deploy their own uh, Nginx uh, app, they will use a bundle, they will set their own images, maybe they will do some little configuration of, of that deployment, but they will use in the bundle those uh, standard modules created by platform teams. Right? That's one way to do it. And you don't need the repo. You don't need to look in the repo. Like the platform team will publish all these modules to the internal container registry. 
right? And app developers, app teams will just use those modules from there. That's one approach. And maybe it's too strict. Maybe app teams wants to develop their own modules. So maybe the platform team will only create these queue libraries, which, which abstract away a bunch of stuff in Kubernetes, and they will do Timony artifact push of that particular uh, queue library. And when you when the app team creates their own modules, they will do artifact pull. Okay, I want to use all these components and I'm writing my own module because I know best how to uh, configure, how to expose my app configuration. Then the operation team will create a bundle using either modules created by the platform team or the app team or the app team themselves. They will have good bundles for everybody to deploy and they'll publish those and uh, operations team can can use those one it's like it really depends on your organization structure and how teams are collaborating between them uh i think timony and, and and q modules themselves offer a lot of uh um flexibility here um so yeah i don't think there is one way of doing it but it's quite flexible uh the idea is that at the end someone will create a bundle bundle that will use all, all these modules created by someone else or themselves yeah i'm going to touch on that with my own opinion just a little bit as well which is very much in line with what you were saying um but just for why i was a question right is like there's two things that when you're talking about working with platform teams and dev teams, right? There's two different constraints that are important here. One, the platform team is going to say to deploy to our cluster, you must do this, right? There's policies, there's enforcement, and that's always going to happen in the cluster via admission controllers of some variety, and they will enforce that there. However, what I think why I'm always also touching on is that you may be in a position where if you can get buy-in, where the dev teams and the platform teams are using Timoni. You know the platform team for cluster add-ons and the dev teams for their applications you might get to a point where maybe the platform teams are building some best practices that people can consume and i think those could be timoni modules that are versioned and you can opt in to those defaulting behaviors for security context and policies and so forth even though there would be a higher level admission control somewhere so i i think you know you can just the platform team or even the dev teams maybe they do it right maybe you're uh, Amazon and there's 5,000 dev teams working on 10,000 microservices and you write a Timoni module that says this is a good deployment strategy for our clusters and you can opt in to using that behavior if you want. And um, because everything's versions and there's digests, uh, yeah, you can opt into that. So from an opt-in perspective, use the module system for any enforcement. I think it has to be admission control. I don't think Timoni would sit in that pipeline whatsoever. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I no matter how much policy you you can put on a client side uh, in the end someone can do a kubectl edit right on the cluster so you actually need unless you go full on gitops no one connects to the cluster at all there is no way to to work around having webhooks and webhooks are like evil they will bring down your whole cluster, our single point of failure for Kubernetes API. The more webhooks you have, the slower everything gets. Dry runs are, are really, really crazy hard to do with, with webhooks and so on. But that's where we are. That's the reality, right? Uh, yeah. Sadly, yeah, we need to run these webhooks. And when they go down, they take everything down. And good luck saving a cluster uh, if your webhooks are, are in the crash loop. <laughs> yes, we've all been there. Uh, YMO did follow up on their question. So they said they didn't think about sharing VR bundles, but I hope that is an uh, interesting path to you. Um, but they have said, how do we guarantee that the dev team always use the latest bundles from the platform team? Is that possible? The latest modules, maybe. Yeah, the latest modules. So, you know, if the platform team does provide a module, is there any way for them to make sure the dev teams are always upgrading to the latest and greatest? No, no. <laughs> yeah. Unless you don't specify a version in the bundle, and every time you do an apply, team when you look which is the latest, and and it will pull latest. But if you use a digest or a version, you pin that module to a particular version. Of course, yeah. we can roll out with latest everywhere, and every time you don't apply, it will be latest. But 
Yeah, I'm not sure is that the best approach. No, I, I don't. I don't think that's a good pattern. Um, I'll go back to what I said. Like it's when you're using these Timoni modules, I, I feel like you opt into the latest version because you're comfortable, you've tested it, you're happy with it. If any enforcement has to happen, it has to be admission control. Um, so I wouldn't do that this way. Um, but we hope that helps. All right, we've got one more thing to show, I, I believe, which is let's mildly productionize this bundle uh, and do some sort of secret injection. So you did share with me a gist, which is here, um, which let's just copy and paste it first, and then we can run through on why or how this is different. And this actually also correlates to another question that YMO asked at the start of the session. So we will tackle that too. Um, so my bundle.q, let's say the right one. Uh, now here, you are specifying that we have some value for a password using the Q attribute where we're saying that this password will come from a runtime string, which is, I'm assuming, either a flag or an environment variable in a Timoni CLI. And this is then used just to augment the values. Uh, and it's also interpolated down here to the Redis URL. Is that the only changes in this file? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think there are more more things. Yeah, you can delete test enabled through. I don't think that was in the original one. Yeah, delete that. That's the test for team pod info. You could uh, uh, disable test for Redis. So we only. Yeah, so what's important here is there's a secret value that you want to inject into your Timoni application. We're saying, let's get it from runtime. That's all that's important here. And then we use that to set the value on the Redis deploy and interpolate it into the connection string for the pod info. So let's copy the command just down here. And I think there are multiple ways to do this, but uh, I'm, I'm guessing right now. So let's check, right? So if we paste this, what we're saying here is the Redis password is test. And we're doing a bundle vet on bundle.q and runtime from env. So are there multiple ways to provide runtime values beyond the environment is my first question. Yeah, you want to do, yeah, vet is for validating. You want to do an apply instead of that. Yeah, so what we have here is typically for, typical for a CI system, right? You have some, um oh, my claim <laughs> claim yes <laughs> uh, yeah so in a in a ci system right you can have these secret stores i know uh github has one gitlab everybody has it right so and what you can do is uh, read from the ci secret source set an environment variable from that thing, and then pass that through the environment variable to the Timony apply command. And Timony does not read environment variables by default, so you need to actually tell Timony, hey, use the runtime from the environment, because this is something specific to local testing. You, yeah, you say Redis password equals something, Timony apply, which that's, just an environment variable setting, right? It's not, it's not something specific to me that's uh, uh, from the command line. Uh, or we can do an export and, and so on. Um, but if you are doing applying from CI, you can pass in this way secrets through the environment and inject them in the bundles because the bundles usually where they are stored in the Git repo, you shouldn't be placing any sensitive information in there. Uh, if there is a way around it. Uh, if you want to place sensitive information in there, there is a, there is documentation on the Timony website how you can use SOAPs, the CLI, encrypt some JSON or YAML file, and then when you do a bundle apply, besides the Q file, you can also tell Timony, hey, read from this um, YAML file that's decrypted there in place by SOAPs and then remove it. And, goes through the memory and all the SOPs uh, operation model. So this is one way of doing it, right? But when when secrets are in CI, 
but usually with Kubernetes, you have some uh, external secret controller or secrets are arrived into NTCD from Vault or, or stuff like that. So in most cases, you will have these secret values in some resource inside the cluster. Um, so how there is a way with uh, Timony runtimes to tell Timony, hey, query the cluster for a Kubernetes secret, extract this field from here, then use this field as the runtime value inside the bundle, right? And um, we can actually set the, the password now from, from the cluster. So if you go back to the gist, you will um, have to create a Kubernetes secret. So this has created a secret in the in the default namespace. Now we have to create this other file, which is a runtime. Runtime definition. Why is this different? Because runtimes can be reused across bundles. If you have many bundles which have to connect to the same Redis cluster or whatever, use the same way, uh, same thing. You can reuse the runtime to not write the query every time. Yeah, there is a error because diff does not work on immutable uh, things, but it has changed the password here. And also, if you go up, you will see the new password for the Redis um, yeah. replicas and the master things. Nice. Um, and this basically has queried the cluster for the secret. It went to the secret, and this is how you can specify that query. Yeah, this is one of my. My favorite features, like coming back to that whole platform dev thing from the question earlier, you know, like the platform team goes into hopefully puts out a lot of effort to provide in the platform with all of the end cluster add-ons that you need, the external secrets operator hooked up to KMSs or vaults, you know, DNS records, all those external bobs that you need for your application to actually run successfully and been able to do this sort of dynamic lookup um, and inject this in to this money runtime, I think. It just simplifies a whole lot of what we're trying to do, um, especially when you start getting into GitOps and you've got controllers and things like that there. Because, I mean, there is a Timoni controller, right, that runs all of this in cluster for you. No. No, I thought there was. Ah, all right. That's next week's mission, Stefan. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is awesome and um, very, very cool. So uh, is there, I think we're showing everything, right? Let's stop yeah. sharing my screen. Right, cool. So if anyone has any last minute questions, now is your time to get them in for Stefan before we wrap up. This session has gone on a little bit longer than we did anticipate, but um, I've had a whole lot of fun. So just, you know, thank you so much, Stefan, for joining me and, and, and guiding us through this. Um, if you're happy to, well, we just wait a few minutes for any last minute questions. Sure. What What's next? Like what, what's on your roadmap for, for Timone? So I have this proposal around multi-cluster deployments where the runtime definition that you've played with, uh, the size values will also have a list of clusters. Uh, so you can run a single apply command that will target all these clusters and it will get values from each cluster and so on. Um, that's, that's one of my things that I would like to do uh, next when I have the time to work on it. Um, yeah, and slowly I want to, you know, it all depends in the end on the amount of people using it and the feedback I'm getting uh, for it, but I would really like, I don't know, Q1 next year to stabilize the API. Everything is V1, alpha one right now. I think I have a good, I have some good concepts uh, implemented there. I'm, I could just label it 
V1, Beta 1, but I, I, yeah, I know. it took us three years to make Flux version 2GA, and I'm not the type of person that rushes into labeling things GA <laughs> or stable. So I think I will um, wait more before getting more more users, more feedback, and, and stabilize the API. Only after the API is in stable shape, um, can be a discussion around the team only controller for Flux, the team only controller on its own, whatever, whatever uh, the options are. Um, also around controllers, I I really don't like the idea that you would be you'll have to write the bundle in a YAML file because kubectl apply or the API server does not understand Q, it only understands YAML or JSON or yeah, Kubernetes objects. So maybe I'll write my Kubernetes API server extension that you can do on that. It actually understands Q and you don't need to write YAML at all um, to I know, uh, receive the Q and do the things there. I I'm not sure. Uh, there are so many ideas floating around. Um, but yeah, at some point there will be a controller. Uh, how it will look. Uh, what what I know for sure is that I don't want uh, for the custom resource to be a representation of an instance. I want the custom resource to be a representation of a bundle because that's a proper app definition made out of many pieces with things, inputs from the cluster and so on. So I think that will be uh, the API object that, that Kubernetes will, will deal with. Yeah. Um, I know, not to go too far off track, right, but going over to the FluxDD stage of things, there was a discussion, I think, some point last year about potentially allowing the customized controller to duct tape the sources. Is that something that's still being considered? Do you know what I mean by that, or should I? One more duct tape the source? Duct, duct tape, sorry, it's my Scottish accent. Um, so you know how the customized controller has got hard-coded references to like the OCI repository, the Git repository, et cetera. Like if we could just say it accepts anything that has these sets of fields on the, on the status or spec, and it doesn't have to be one of those, you know, duct typing, right? It just mm -hmm. it looks like a source provider, but it does, it's not one that we know of. Um, would that simplify things for a Timonic controller where you could have a simple controller that monitored the OCI repository, ran the Timoni command in the cluster and spat out a new source. Like that, that seems like it would be a nice approach. No. No. <laughs> Definitely not. All right. I'll shut up. Customize controls is about customize. It does patches, which shouldn't be in any way something that you deal with Timoni. Like Timoni has the stage apply, all of that, right? It should be the Timoni reconciler that sets the cluster state, not customized controller, which does customize things. And it also does play in Kubernetes YAML manifest, was the part I was thinking about hooking into, right? Is just have a Timoni controller that just spits out the, the YAML for the customized controller to apply. That's but, that's already how you can do it. You do Timoni. But I can't do it in cluster, right? I would have to push, I would have to run it locally, generate the YAML and push it somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can run a registry in cluster, very tiny. There are many registries out there that can run in cluster. But I, I think a Timony controller should be an applier, uh, yeah. before anything, because yeah, it has its own uh, mechanisms, which are very different from Flux customized controller or Flux helm controller. Um, cool. Yeah. Well, we can schedule a live stream for how long do you need to write that? Two weeks, three weeks? Like... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. Maybe uh, <laughs> uh, after the API, it's all set, um, which is the most important thing right now. And I also like to get a good feeling of is the user experience for authoring Q modules good? Are going people, are people going to write modules? If, if they aren't and Q is not appealing to them, why would I continue this project? I'll just archive it and move uh, move forward. It's uh, it's very tied to the language. All right. 
Yeah, I'd be very sad to see that. Um, I know the Q team are actively working on their language server implementation. I know uh, I spoke to Paul Jolly recently, and he said that that was his next job, um, is to improve that authoring experience for people actually writing Q. Um, I know they're also handling the module stuff, but you covered that earlier on in the session. So yeah, I, I mean, for me, the fact that you can't share uh, bits of Q easily is not the top problem for me with Q. My, my, my major issue with Q is definitely a lack of a language server. I cannot do go to definition. I don't have auto completion. Yeah. I don't have anything. Right? Yeah. So all the things that are supposed to have, because everything is type safe, everything is so nice. Like when it comes <laughs> to the editor, you are V mode with nothing else, right? Uh, yeah. Not even, yeah, not, not, I don't know, even uh, writing YAML, has auto completion now for Kubernetes in VS Code and IntelliJ. Uh, Q doesn't even have that. So yeah, unless they get there, I don't see how people will uh, uh, will enjoy writing Q. Um, yeah. Oh, also, yeah. Copilot does not understand Q, which is kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> It'll get there. These are all easy things to fix, I hope, right? And I, mm -hmm. I hope these will be fixed quickly and in six months' time at the next KubeCon in Paris, we can all yeah. have a laugh and see things are much better now. Um, but, but, but we'll see, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't think we have any more questions from the audience. So I'll just Great. say again, thank you so much. Like I, I find that's one of the most interesting projects in the CNCF landscape right now. I hope people, one, like what they've seen and to start going out there doing tutorials blogs videos and contributing wherever possible because you know these open source projects need momentum to keep it interesting for you to be doing all the heavy lifting and hard work and i hope that other people come along to help you with that as well so thank you again thank you very much david for inviting me it was like this was my first ever talk on timony and i really enjoyed it <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all. Um, feel free to leave comments after the fact. I'll do my best to route them to Stefan as they come in, and we'll see you all next time. Have uh, a wonderful weekend. Uh,